The crisis that broke out in the United States real estate sector in the spring of 2007 has spread to a crisis not only of the dollar system but the global economy. And the crisis is a direct consequence, and you can measure this by legislative decisions made by the U.S. Congress and by various presidents from Bill Clinton on uh, through George W. Bush to deregulate the banking financial sector. The deregulation of banking, the removal of government supervision over fraud, over corruption in the financial system, opened the floodgates so that the largest banks of Wall Street became literally criminal enterprises. Now in the former Soviet Union, people have experience with banks that are criminal enterprises, as I understand. Well, this is the case in the United States, the so-called bastion of, of democracy. And that crisis exploded in 2008 on a world scale when the Treasury Secretary, Henry Paulson, former Wall Street banker, made a decision to let one particular bank fail in order to panic the Congress into giving him unprecedented financial powers to rescue his other friends on Wall Street. Since that point, the free market model, as, as uh, we can call it, of Margaret Thatcher, of uh, Milton Friedman, of Ronald Reagan, that took over step by step the American economy, and, and through the American economy, because it's so overwhelmingly large, or was back in the 80s, it began slowly to infest continental European economies. So the idea of lowering wages, of breaking the power of trade unions, uh, of reducing pension benefits for workers who've worked 35, 40 years, that began to even become uh, accepted debate in countries like Germany, where I live. And the spread of this financial cancer, financialization, as, as uh, Jeff referred to it, uh, is a crisis that has reached a point where something dramatic has to happen because the rates of new debt creation by the United States government, not only to finance its wars, but to keep its bankrupt banking system functioning, or misfunctioning, the, day, the rate of debt creation has become so enormous that the United States is, well, today it's federal debt to gross domestic product is over 103%. Five years ago, it was something like 60 some percent, which gives you an idea. This is exponential growth of federal debt. So the United States in debt terms is rapidly becoming a banana republic. This is the free market model that, as I understand, uh, President Saakashvili, when he was brought in with the support of Washington some years ago in, in 2004, uh, tried to introduce in Georgia. It's the model that's been pushed since the time of Yeltsin by the Western banks on Russia. And this is a model of a bankrupt United States, of a bankrupt Britain. The banking systems of these two countries, from, from the standpoint of the largest banks, is brain dead. And what they are doing is seeking new sources of loot to prop up those private banks it has nothing to do with propping up the United States economy. The money is going to these private banks, to the American oligarchs, if you will. The model goes back to something that was created during the British Empire called the British East India Company, where a private corporation received the backing of the military power and the state of Her Majesty's government, England, 
to not only loot India, but to extract opium from India and use that opium to loot the silver and the reserve wealth of the Chinese uh, kingdom during the opium wars in the 1840s. The banking and financial institutions of the United States and the United Kingdom form an interlocking directorate if you want to understand the nature of this beast. It's not the government. The government has become a hand servant, if you will, to private corporate interests that are above the law. The banks, the military industry, Boeing, Raytheon, McDonnell Douglas, Halliburton, and the big oil is part of that military industry complex because they need the military support to go in and control the oil of the world. And agribusiness, U.S. agribusiness, genetically modified the seeds from Monsanto, uh, the destruction of the food chain through industrialization of, of uh, uh, food production and centralization uh, of the control of food in the 20 to 30 corporations worldwide, Anglo-American corporations. So that private power is what is destroying literally what's healthy in the world economy over the past 30 to 35 years especially. Here in Georgia, I'm impressed by the warmth of the people that I've met and I'm impressed by the fact that you haven't yet allowed your food production to be totally destroyed by Western agribusiness. I hope that you don't, because you need that to nourish a new generation. But you're given a choice between this radical free market, privatization of your water, privatization of your uh, state resources, and so forth, versus what? Well, I think the alternative does not mean a return to Soviet central planning that Georgia should rejoin a new Soviet Union. But I, I think the central question today is, is what faced Germany, what, what uh, Jeffrey Summers described as the uh, national economic model that created the economic miracle in the 1870s to 1900s, early 1900s, of the German industrial emergence. And that was a combination of state, national goals, and private sector initiative to reach those goals. And that combination, together with the support of basic infrastructure, infrastructure necessary for the national economy, should be a national priority and not a private for profit. That means your railroads. That means your, your water supply, your electricity. That has to be specially monitored and specially controlled by, by the state uh, because it's for the benefit of the overall economy. And there should be a process of dialogue between citizens and the government to develop priorities for that development. But the nation state, the national economy, is an irreplaceable foundation of that future growth. To my mind, Georgia is in a very positive position in this process to influence change in the context of the one geographical space in the entire planet right now that has an immediate economic future of tremendous real growth, real economic growth, not, not banks, not financial growth, not paper, but real industrial growth railroad infrastructure, uh, electrification, uh, building up of industries and so forth to feed that growth. And that is Eurasia. The Americans, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which American neoconservatives and the Pentagon helped to bring about the liberty in order to loot the former Soviet Union, the one thing that the elites, Brzezinski, Kissinger, others, uh, in the foreign policy establishment fear is the emergence of a coherent land space in Eurasia. A land space that would have the best intellectual capacities in the world, 
uh, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but my experience living in Germany, which used to be the bastion of an intellectual scientific tradition 100 some years ago, uh, it's since World War II rapidly declined, especially in the last 30 years. Uh, certainly that's the case in the United States in higher education for science and technology. Uh, it's cannibalized on the science tradition that uh, has existed. But the scientific and technological skill levels of Eurasia are perhaps the leading skill in the world. The destruction of the Russian Academy of Sciences doesn't hold well if that is allowed to continue in Russia, from what uh, my Russian friends have told me. Uh, that's the free market mafia trying to destroy what's left of uh, any ability of Russia to rebuild in a, in a uh, innovative way. But I think that tradition exists also in Georgia. And I think, I know that it exists in China. And to begin to link Central Asia, the Caucasus, uh, parts of the Middle East, Russia, China, the Shanghai cooperation countries, Iran, through infrastructure, through peaceful economic cooperation, building bridges of cooperation, gives you a unique advantage compared with a Western Europe which continues to look across the Atlantic for its big brother, uh, an American economy and an American superpower that is in fundamental decline much as Britain was before 1914. So I think you have hard choices to make. Your number one problem is the number one problem is everywhere in the world that I'm familiar with is the fact that most people have become passive. That they think my voice doesn't matter. Uh, it's hopeless. It's negative. And if you examine history, it's often one or two or five or ten or a few hundred voices that speak out for what's good for the majority that makes the difference in history. And I think those of you here tonight represent an intellectual stratum of your country uh, that can make those choices and make those decisions heard. And I wish you good luck. Thank you. Uh, Georgians were told to